<laughs> USC LSU game reaction. 23 USC goes into Las Vegas and makes it a terrible night for the 13 LSU Tigers as they now lost their fifth consecutive season opener three wow. under Brian Kelly 27 to 20 USC wins over LSU saw that stat this morning I said yep we're bringing it up on the show today yeah. um, so I don't know what angle we want to start here Cody I think we've got to give credit to USC what was your first takeaway that you saw from this game specifically how USC Trojans played yeah, you know, I think the biggest thing for me was how that defense was playing. You know, I know I know that LSU uh, last year, their offense was kind of synonymous, like was really the last two years with Jane Daniels, their offense has been pretty, pretty explosive. Um, but I think I th like the fact that USC was kind of able to keep the Bayou Bengals down to hold them to only 20. I understand it's week one. And, you know, sometimes it kind of takes some time for it to click when you have a new quarterback. Garrett Nussmeyer has been there. He knows the mm -hmm. system. He's been with Ryan Kelly. For the last two years waiting his time behind Jane Daniels so I think to me there was kind of like a little bit of a like an expectation that maybe they were going to be a little bit better on offense and that's not a shot you know I'm looking at his stats here 29 to 38 304 yards two touchdowns and interception um, I think Garrett Nussmeyer actually performed really really well um, I think he did a really good job finding Kyron Lacey early in that football game I want to say in the first drive Kyron Lacey had like five catches or something like that on the, yeah. just the first drive and uh, I think that that was like very, very important to kind of get Kyron Lacey not only into the game, but also get, they were short little like hitch, slant, quick out. It kind of gets, lets Garrett Nussmeyer kind of get into the flow of the game as well. So um, anyway, I thought overall USC's defense, Ben don't break. I thought they did a really good job um, kind of weathering the storm um, when uh, the running back Emery from LSU started to kind of get rolling a little bit in the second half as well. Um, and then obviously whenever you have a Lincoln Riley offense, you know that it's just a matter of time until they start get, get rolling as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, USC unable to get any pass rush, no sacks, but it felt like they were in position the entire game. Um, coverage was great towards the end. Um, I think the biggest question marks we had for both teams, like it's crazy how USC LSU were both in the same boat, right? Both lost their Heisman trophy winners, both lost a ton of weapons offensively, new coordinators, especially in the defensive coordinators for both LSU got a new OC last night. Uh, after Mike Denbrock left, but I think the biggest thing for me that sticks out is just the weapons both these teams have. I, I mean, I mean, Kyron Lacey, we saw flashes of him last year. He's a phenomenal athlete. He's a great wide receiver. He'll get a thousand yards for LSU. But for USC, ten receivers caught the ball last night for USC. So if you're Lincoln Riley, this is what you dream of. Like you've got yes. a quarterback Miller Moss that's been in the program for two years. And shout out to him by the way, unbelievable story. Him and Garrett Nussmeyer, we'll get into both those in just a bit. But for him to have 10 wide receivers, and then for him to go in the transfer portal and get a running back in Woody Marks. This guy's phenomenal, Cody. This Jeez. guy's a transfer from Mississippi State. I mean, 16 carries, 68 yards, two touchdowns. So now you're able to run the football, too, because Marshawn, I think people forget the running back room at USC the last couple of years has been kind of slept on. Like Marshawn Lloyd, and I forget the other guy that they had that went in the draft too, but they kind of went a dual running back between those two. But I was thoroughly impressed with the weapons that USC and, and LSU had. And look, it's a tough game for Brian Kelly. A little stat here. I mean, I don't know. You probably saw his presser after, right? Uh, I heard that he slammed the table, but I didn't yeah. actually look yeah, at Yeah, he, he uh, slammed the table. Basically, he was talking about how he's so tired of when there's games that they've got to put away that it, the sideline feels like they've already won the game, which I don't know if that feeling was when they were down four point three points or when they were tied or what, but that's definitely something, a culture issue. Um, You're, you're a coach too. Like talk about, I guess the frustrations of that, what it's like, I guess, you know, I mean, we've all been there. We are players like, Oh yeah. Like we feel great and stuff, even though the game's not over. Like, how do you, how do you think Brian Kelly should, I guess, change that? Is that just a culture thing? Like, how do you start doing that? Because obviously they got to get it done right now because it's week one and we still got 11 weeks left in the season. Yeah, I, th I think people, like, I think there's a lot of, like, knee-jerk reactions when it comes to week one. And I think that ultimately at the end of the day, I think one of the, like, we lost our first game, like the team that I coach. We're, we're extremely talented. We're probably one of the better teams in the country up here in Canada. And we lost our first our first game. It was a close football game, very similar to this. Other team came down, scored. We had an opportunity to come down, tie the game late, didn't get the opportunity to get the job done. And what we really told those guys was basically like, you got to leave it there. We lost the game. It's over. It's done with. All of our goals are ahead of us. We can still win the conference. We can still win 
our side of Canada. We can still win the national championship. Everything is still in front of us. Don't let one loss and the mindset after one loss turn into two, three, four losses down the road. And I think our team has done a really good job, right? We're five and one now going in. We get to play that team again now at home. And so yeah. I think the fact that LSU is going to have the opportunity to kind of bounce back and be able to, and they have everything to play for. This was a non-conference game. They still have the opportunity to kind of go into the SEC, make some noise in the SEC, play well. And I think that at once that's done, once this game is over and done with, you let just flush it, no matter whether you win or you lose, because a non-conference game, especially in week one, when you have another 12 weeks to go in the regular season, as well as a possible SEC championship game, yeah. I think um, LSU is going to be just fine. And I think that as long as they don't panic in uh, in Baton Rouge, I think they'll be just fine. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a good offense. They have a good defense. Harold Perkins looked like his old self again, flying Gosh. around. Um, Didn't know he changed his number. Kind of build on Garrett Nussmeyer. Obviously, he threw for over 300 yards. Kyron Lacey was getting busy early. They like Mr. Emery came out of nowhere uh, with over with 61 yards rushing and on 10 carries, averaging 6.1 yards a carry. I think they have a lot to work with, and I think that they again, there's a lot of knee jerk reactions in week one, and I think the culture of like oh like we lost, oh the world is over, like relax you have everything to play for lsu so just one law one non-conference loss in a neutral site game against a team that's probably going to move up into the top 20 maybe even top 15 after this win hmm. and probably have a very good season i think you guys will be just fine yeah i think for both sides um secondary obviously needs a little improvement i don't know if it's the secondary that needs improvement or the wide receivers are that elite maybe it's the year of the wide receiver i don't even know dude i mean the, the amount of catches we keep seeing every single day it's only week one well the um, thing Kyron, about the catches the Kyron Hudson, the, chill out please yeah i mean the thing about the catches in this game when they were elite level like these are contested 50 50 mm -hmm. passes so it's like mm -hmm. was this were they in position yes did they make a play on the ball sometimes even yes it was just Mr. Hudson's over here doing one hand OBJ catches every single every single play. It's unbelievable. And that was yeah. someone we didn't even like we previewed USC. We talked about all the other wide receivers that we didn't even mention Kyron Hudson. This is Absolutely. the guy that was the wide receiver one. And, and credit to him for showing out in that game. But <clears throat> I want to go back to Brian Kelly's response. I don't really take too much. Honestly, I give him kudos. I think that's the first time we've really seen Brian Kelly take accountability, take responsibility. And dude, sure. I mean, losing three straight home openers like that's frustrating especially when it's yeah. the same way like two years ago it was off the field goal last year they got blown out against florida state and then this again like late touchdown could have been a field goal against usc so and being frustrated i don't i don't overreact about that brian kelly since he's been at lsu against top 25 teams three and six mm. three and six marcus freeman from Notre Dame, seven and five. Just want to note. Wow, that I see what you did there. Little Notre note Dame that plug. Real Look, Notre I mean, plug. Brian Kelly's one of the best coaches of all time. I love him. He did sure. great for Notre Dame. But Absolutely. his biggest thing with Notre Dame was we. This is how Notre Dame lost football games. Was LS or Notre Dame felt like they were going to win the game, and then last second, they they'd get sniped and they'd lose the game. Like that's just how Notre Dame football was. Like that's how you saw we made the playoff all these couple of years. Every time we made the playoff, we got blown out. Like. Just because we thought we were already there, we thought we won when the game didn't even start. So um, I think LSU will turn it around. You're right. Um, I, I, let, I actually was impressed by Garrett Nussmeyer, and I want to talk about him real quick, and then we'll flip to USC. Um, what did you see from Garrett Nussmeyer? Like, what were your expectations going in? Because you're the quarterback guy. And then what did you see from him? Because uh, for me, I was, I, I, was, I was thoroughly impressed. I was very impressed with Garrett Nussmeyer and the way that he was able to handle. I thought that USC was playing very, very aggressive. And I think I like I like when USC like when I think of USC defense I think of you know linebacker U where they're blitzing their linebackers corners and safeties are playing aggressive and downhill and I felt like they kind of got back to that and mm -hmm. I feel like genuinely it was um, early in the game they did such a good job of getting the ball out of Garrett Nussmeyer's hands and really just Garrett Nussmeyer himself making sure that trust your first read make the throw second and three is okay second and four is okay as long as we're just getting yards getting yards and not having any negative plays i think he did a great job avoiding the negative play he did throw an interception in this football game however i believe it was deflected if i'm if i'm remembering yeah i think it like, was i think it, it was, was a tipped pass so ultimately like he was making the right reads at the right time on time on target still um obviously he didn't come out with a w but i think he showed out very 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 well 
filling in for, like you said, the Heisman Trophy winner, Jaden Daniels from last year. Miller Moss, man. Let's talk about him. The last series, second and 15, LSU's 27, come off a false start. He finds Kyron Hudson. Mm. Oh, my gosh. I'm looking at this. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah. The whole shot, I mean, that seam ball in between the cover two and for Kyron Hudson to even have the awareness to know that that safety's coming and he's coming in hot to catch that football. But I just thought what was so impressive from him is just how accurate he is. Like, every single football was – it like it was like the window right here. It was like it was right in front of their face, or maybe just below their chin. Every single football, or if even or even if it was over a defender, he'd get it over the defender too. Yeah, Kyron Hudson, and he got it there. That's all that matters. But <laughs> yeah. um, talk about what you saw from Miller Moss, man. Because one, the leadership, great story. I mean, he was there for two years, could have transferred out, and for him, credit to him. He's known the system for a couple of years. He looked confident behind his throws. Now he's got this year, and he's got one more year with Lincoln Riley. Like I just feel like. I know Caleb Williams was the guy for Lincoln Riley. I know he's an elite talent. First first overall pick, Heisman Trophy winner. I get that. But don't you kind of feel like Miller Moss is like the quarterback that Lincoln Riley want? Like the build, the the pocket passing, the, to get the ball out to a bunch of web. Like, don't you feel like that's like Lincoln Riley's prototype if he had to make a prototype? I feel that's it's a great t- question. It's, it's tough because it's, I'm, not, I'm not knocking Caleb Williams. I'm just saying like, you're not going to see Miller Moss roll out of the pocket and make plays with his legs or make some absurd plays. You're just going to see a guy that's going to execute the offense and make the correct the offense, read. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what I, what I, what I saw from Miller Moss was very similar to what you just said. Third year in the system has done a great job, clearly learning and understanding where to go with the football. Um, you said it yourself. The accuracy was ridiculous. I think the the best throw of the night to me was the touchdown to Jacoby Lane, mm-hmm. um, where he was on the left hash and threw a fade all the way to the right sideline. And for those of you who guys, those casuals or people who haven't played the game, throwing from the left hash a fade all the way to the right corner of the end zone is an extremely difficult throw. And he literally dropped it in the bucket perfectly. And when I saw that, that kind of made me kind of perk up like, whoa, like, okay, like you made some throws today, but that throw to me was was the throw of the night. And I think that that was kind of one of those throws that kind of gave him that confidence to know like, okay, I'm locked in, I'm ready to go. I know it started, it was, it was about six minutes left in the fourth quarter. And it was almost kind of like when he made that throw to tie the game or to take the lead, it was almost like, okay, USC is probably not going to lose this game. Even though LSU did come down, kick a tying field goal, but it was like, okay, well, you guys just came down, kick the tying field goal. Let me go back out there, start slicing you guys up again based on what I just did to you guys last drive. And so um, I just, I saw a very confident, a comfortable Miller Moss against a very aggressive, I got to tip the cap. The LSU defense looked way improved that, from last year, um, very aggressive. I think Harold Perkins is kind of back in that spot that he needs to be, just mm-hmm. being able to pin his ears back and just play football. Um, but yeah, Miller Moss, very, very impressive debut, man, as the guy. Um, and I think that he's going to be able to build on that. And I think the fact that Miller Moss has had that success against LSU is going to bode well for USC kind of going forward as they attack the Big Ten this year. Saw some tweets last night. USC won the national championship. I thought that was so funny. Their celebration after. I get like it's Vegas. It's an SEC team. You make an upset. I think you got to celebrate like that too. But yeah, I um, mean, the last time they were in a season opening game against an SEC school, we remember what happened against Jalen Hurts in Alabama, mm. fifty-two to six. In case you guys were wondering, <laughs> that was in the that was in the AT and T Stadium, right? Yes. Oh my gosh! When they all actually... came out crawling like they were dogs, and everyone was like, uh, "Oh yeah, USC is gonna ball out." Yeah, no. <laughs> who was their quarterback that year max was brown all that... oh, right shout out max brown i think he's doing commentary and stuff like that right now too so is. um what do you make of all the batted passes that miller moss had on him is that just um, an lsu I... testament is that kind of you know him being too quick to throw the football is that just the athleticism of lsu like i think lsu was aware that they were going to be bringing pressure and they knew that when with pressure means that the ball needs to come out quickly and so the defensive linemen were like, look, we're probably not going to get to him, but what we can do is disrupt his passing lanes by throwing our hands up. And what you saw was, like you said, a lot of batted passes because, again, when you bring pressure, there's side adjustments, which usually means like you're replacing a blister with the ball, 
or recognizing where my check down is right away so that I can get the ball out quickly. We call them pressure releases. Um, and with that, though, if the defensive line is aware, like, hey, we're bringing pressure, so we got to make sure we get our hands up or, or the blitzer himself is jumping in the air. It just is what it is. It's just one of those things that just unfortunately happens from time to time. I think too back to that Jacoby Lane touchdown. That was the play when it was a it was a offsides was a free play. Right? Yeah, it was a free play. Yeah, dude, the execution on that I think is something that not a lot of people are talking about. People who don't know in college football, that type of play is what you practice a hundred times during the off season. Yep. Basically, when it's an offsides, the free play, everyone go vertical. You can throw it uh -huh. interception. You can throw it wherever. It's gonna come back, obviously, because the defense had the offside there. But I thought the execution, especially young players. I mean, you've got sophomores out there on offense and making those type of plays. I think it's a testament to Lincoln Riley, which I might say I need a documentary, Cody, on how Lincoln Riley coaches his quarterbacks. Because <laughs> my golly, name the last quarterback Lincoln Riley had that wasn't elite. In that wasn't football. good. Yeah, no. Like I mean, I don't know. I mean. Baker was first, right? And then Kyler, and then Jalen, and then Caleb, and then Miller. I don't yeah. even know who was before that. Like, I don't. Where was Lincoln Riley before he took Oklahoma job? Ooh, great question. We'll we'll, we'll, pin, we'll put a pin on that, and we'll we'll do some research. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna do that. Um, talk about um, gosh, I wasn't gonna run it up to you. Talk about this USC defense. I, dude, this first week, if I had a week one takeaway, picking the right coordinators is huge for some of these big programs who have issues like yes. the defensive coordinator from usc like what what's usc's biggest problem tackling being in position they did that last night the offensive coordinator from penn state they, they no explosive plays eight explosive plays all season they had four against west virginia okay mm -hmm. and then for notre dame with the offensive coordinator i just think it kind of fits the personnel that they have like no, no offense to the other offensive coordinator i think it was tommy reese what they had before but and then someone else in between and then now Denbrock. Denbrock just kind of fits their scheme what i'm saying is it's insane how one coordinator away that fits the system lincoln riley especially a guy in lynn that he said hey he had a board i heard of all the dream coaches that he wanted when he got to USC, it was just a matter of time. And mm -hmm. Lynn was one of those guys. Talk about what you saw um, from USC's defense, Lynn's scheme, and then just kind of talk about, I guess, what you think the importance of coordinators is. Because I think all, especially Penn State and USC, I think those two coordinators, one, save their jobs, and two, like, turn the perspective and turn, you know, I guess, what we think about both of those teams, and they're going to excel this year. Sure. I think to start off with, to answer your question, um, what I saw from the USC defense was a level of aggression and, but also a level of fundamental that we hadn't really seen in a long time. You can really tell that they stressed, you said, tackling, being in the proper position, proper leverage. I think that was one of the things last year that there were so many busts in coverage. There were so many um, misreads, uh, missed tackles, just the lack of the fundamentals. And it, you could definitely tell that they spent a lot of time in the offseason really kind of honing in on okay, near hip, drive, run your feet. Like mm -hmm. those are, I, people think of those as like little things, but ultimately at the end of the day, those are like those little things kind of stack up to be uh, kind of what allows you to play fast and play physical. So I think USC had a level of physicality, not only in the front seven, but also in the secondary. Um, that was very, very impressive. Um, I think they did a really good job tackling, although there was a short period of time where uh, Jackson Emery started to get off a little bit for LSU. By the way, one of the few holdovers from the 2019 National Championship team, Mr. Emery, he actually had left LSU and came back. So kind of cool little tidbit there. Damn, um, he's a little bit. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in terms of the importance of coordinators, I'd say other than I think Alabama, who I think Nick Saban kind of create like – it's almost like he was creating head coaches out of his coordinators a lot. But I think when head coaches are able to kind of give up that control and allow themselves to kind of just be general managers of the program and allow someone to really focus on the offense and someone to really focus on the defense, that when you really, that's when you really start to have success. Um, I think uh, Ryan Day, for example, at Ohio State, I think Ohio State is going to reap the benefits mm. of the fact that now Chip that they Kelly. have an offensive coordinator there, instead of him calling plays, it's going to be Chip Kelly. And I think that's good. Him alleviating that pressure from himself is going to allow him to focus on his full team um, and then allow Chip Kelly to kind of do his mastermind thing at Ohio State. So, um, again, that's my long-winded answer of kind of asking, answering about the, the importance of coordinators. When you really look at the successful teams and programs, they do such a good job 
keeping those coordinators in house. Uh, Brent Venables, he, like when Oklahoma was good, it was Jeff Levy was there as offense coordinator. Uh, Hal Mummy was there as offense coordinator. Uh, even um, uh, who was the f- Mike Leach? Mike Leach was an offensive coordinator for Oklahoma mm-hmm. at one point, right? And while Brent Venables was there as the defensive coordinator, Oklahoma was able to play good defense. They had guys, Tony Jefferson and others that played DB, linebacker, um, Terrence Marshall, Rocky Kalmus, um, a bunch of different guys that were able to play defense on that on that on those Oklahoma teams that allowed Oklahoma to be a full football team. When you have an offensive coordinator that's your head coach as well, or a defensive coordinator that's your head coach as well, your team tends to move in that direction as a team, as opposed to being a well-rounded football team. I think mm-hmm. that's where I think USC, um, obviously. Lincoln Riley is the play caller, but I think the fact that he was able to get such a stalwart at defensive coordinator is going to bode well for USC, not only um, in the non-conference, but also as they kind of get into this conference slate in the Big Ten. Yeah, I agree. Everything you said there, spot on. Uh, I'm looking at Lincoln Riley's coaching history right now. He was a um, offensive coordinator 2015-2016 at Oklahoma. And then next year took the job. Before that, he was and at East Carolina. And then before that, he was actually at East Carolina. Yeah, yeah, East Carolina. Yeah, yeah correct. Um, any closing thoughts here? We look at both of these teams moving forward. I mean, USC and the Big Ten, maybe a different perspective on them. Um, at Michigan in a couple weeks will be a fun game for them, to, for them to play in. Hostile environment. Michigan maybe coming off of a loss against Texas, or maybe they come off a win against Texas. How much pressure on both those teams? And then you got Penn State at home later in the season, midseason, at Washington. And then the last game of the season, you got home against Notre Dame, which will be one of those games. You never know with both teams. It could be a CFP spot for them. And then for LSU, they have um, a a bye basically next week. They play Nichols. Pretty easy schedule. And then a home game October 12th against Ole Miss at Texas A&M October 26th. Alabama comes to town on November 9th. And then Oklahoma the last game of the season so mm. both have some really interesting like they, they both have some great ranked matchups um i'm interested to see how usc can bounce back and keep going against at michigan that will be another test to see there in a big. road environment um what, what do you i mean what are your closing thoughts about both these teams as we kind of wrap up this usc lsu react I can't believe 22 minutes it's, i feel like we only talked for like five minutes <laughs> <laughs> no uh what i'd say is just usc i think uh bottle up whatever energy, whatever it is, whatever it is you had for breakfast that day, whatever it is your pregame ritual was, mm. find a way to bottle that up and keep doing it. Because if you're able to play defense this way, and usually defense is like ahead of offense at the beginning of the year, if you're able to play defense like this now and then continue to grow that offense to where Miller Moss is more and more comfortable as the guy with all these wide receivers, also shout out to Zach Branch. You should have had a kick return for a touchdown. Not sure how you let the kicker. Dude, he should have went left. He should have went left, left, bro. Like literally, <laughs> the kicker's left. in front of him. I like was telling my friend this. I'm like, dude, if he goes horizontal left, he's outrunning him and then take it upfield. Oh, that made me so mad. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to see, uh, dude. Kickoff return touchdown is one Exciting. of my favorite plays of all yes. time. Um, and then in terms of LSU, I just say leave Week One where it's at. You played well. You just ran out of time. I think there's a lot to learn from it. Once you learn from it, throw the tape away. Because, you, like I said, you can't let one loss turn into two, three um, when you have everything to play for. Um, it was a non-conference game against a very well-coached and disciplined team, and you lost by a touchdown. One score loss, essentially in their backyard, because we, as we know, Vegas is only three, four hours away from L.A. LSU had to kind of come across the country for this game. I think they showed up. They showed out. They played well enough. I think Coach Kelly has a lot to work with. Um, I think that as long as there's not too big of a reaction, a knee-jerk reaction to this game, LSU should be just fine. And even though it sucks they lost the season opener, they're known for bouncing back. I mean, they bounced back the last three years. The last two years I looked up, I think they've won their they won four or five games after that first open season, season and loss. So um, right. both teams, we'll see where they end up. Great game. USC goes out on top 27-20 to 20 against LSU. For Cody Oaks, I'm Jackson Groff. Week 2 preview predictions coming later this week. We'll see you. Peace!